The three circles are pillars of who we are as a church. The large circle there, the letter O, reminds us that as a church, that we are all about Jesus and we're only about Jesus. We will always be about Jesus. Every week, you will hear Jesus mentioned a hundred times here because as a church, we only want to be about Jesus. The second circle reminds us that we are family. We do this together. We live in community together. We are essentially one family, one body, brothers and sisters in Jesus. We're a family that holds each other accountable, loves each other, forgives each other, encourages each other. The final circle reminds us that we are on mission. We exist to make Jesus famous. We see that all people, regardless of race, regardless of sex, regardless of sexual orientation, social or economic status, that all people are created in God's image, and we long for them to know and love and worship Jesus. And that's what we're about. We're a missional church that wants to make Jesus famous by proclaiming his love to a people that desperately needs it. So why this series and why even talk about becoming a member at Loft City? Does it make any difference at all? Does it make a difference whether you sign a piece of paper saying you're a member? Um, you can keep coming here week in and week out. Will it make any difference at all? What we've been realizing is there are a lot of people who don't know what it really means to be devoted to Jesus as a disciple who makes disciples as part of a local church body. What are we really about? What are we calling you to be committed to? So we wanted to lay it all out for you and be very clear of what we're committing to you as a church as well as what you are committing to us as members. And let me say, for some of you, you might not be ready for that, and that's fine. You sign up whenever you are ready. So the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about this. And then on March 8th, Saturday, we will have a membership class where there will be a Q&A, and you can ask questions, whatever questions you want. And we'll feed you lunch, and we'll just hang out and fellowship. Um, Renny talked about bringing a clown and letting the clown do all the talking to make it more entertaining, interesting, instead of just a lecture. So we'll find ways to make it creative. Um, so it won't be just a boring membership class. but. Um, but we want you to be committed to the church. And during the same time online, we will create a membership application. It's not like a college application. There's no essays. It's just a one page where we just get to know you. And there's also a covenant of things that we commit to to one another. It's a two-way street where you guys commit to stuff and we commit to stuff. And these aren't new things that you've never heard before. This is what a Christian who loves Jesus should be committed to. Jesus was asked by the religious leaders in Matthew 22, what's the greatest commandment of them all? And they were trying to trick Jesus, but Jesus answered them and he said, the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depends all of the law and all of the prophets. Jesus basically says, this is what God wants you to be about. Love God with everything that you have, and then love your neighbor as yourself. There are three relationships there. There's a relationship with God, an upward one, an act of posture of worship, adoration, and love and dependency. Then there's a posture toward one another of caring for your community, for loving your neighbors, for being on mission. Then there is yourself. It says love your neighbor as yourself. And let's be real, if you haven't received love, if you don't understand what God's love is for you, then you won't know how to love yourself in the right way. The reason many of us don't know how to love others is because we don't know that we are truly, deeply loved by God ourselves. That's the inward part. There's upward, where we gather together to remind ourselves that it's all about Jesus. There's outward, where we go to make Jesus famous in our neighborhood in our community, in the world. And then there's finally inward, where we do that when we get together to encourage one another as a family and remind each other that God loves us, then we hope, encourage, pray, support, and bear with one another together. Upward, Jesus. Outward, mission. Inward, family. None of these are new. You've heard these before. And the last thing we want to talk about is give. 
God has blessed each of you guys with gifts and talents and resources, and we want you to use those in all of these areas to build up the body together, to go on mission and serve, and to worship God. We want you to use your gifts and talents. So that's what the next four weeks are going to look like. And this morning, we're going to talk about gathering, the upward. Why do we gather? Why do we get together week in and week out? Why do we meet on a consistent basis? Why do we expect the body to come together regularly? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and I want to begin in verse 19. Hebrews 10, verse 19. And before I read, let me remind you, we were in the book of Hebrews last year, but the writer of Hebrews is writing to a small church in the city of Rome that is growing through incredible hardships for being followers of Jesus. Their family has rejected them. The government has turned on them. Their friends have turned their backs on them. They have lost their land, their possessions, all because they chose to follow Jesus. And there were people in the church that were beginning to wonder, is it worth following Jesus at all? If it's going to cost us our lives, if it's going to cost us our families, if it's going to cost us everything, is it worth following Jesus? And the writer is writing to warn them from walking away from the faith. And right in the middle of the passage, he gives them a small portion of encouragement. And it begins in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus... By the new and living way he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Let me recap. In the Old Testament, there was a temple where, that was built for God in the Old Testament. In the temple, there was an inner, inner area, a holy place, a sacred place where only the high priest could enter, and he could only enter into it once a year. He, could, he would go. Before that, he would have to make everything ready. He would have to prepare himself. He would have to prepare the vessels and the instruments that he would use. And the way he would do it is he would sprinkle blood and water over all of this stuff. And then he would prepare himself. And he would make a sacrifice to God for the sins of the people. And he would go into the Holy of Holies once a year and present this sacrifice to God. And that on the basis of that sacrifice, God would forgive the people for their sins. And when he does that, the Bible says that God would come and dwell in the temple. God accepted the sacrifice and he would come and dwell among the people. And the curtain that is being referred to there in verse 13 is that there is a new way now for God, for us to get to God, and that's Jesus. Look at verse 21. And since we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Our hearts are sprinkled clean. The blood has covered us. Listen, this morning, if you have put your faith in Jesus as the one who went to the cross in your place and God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in exchange you can become the righteousness of God, the blood has covered you. You are forgiven. You are accepted. The blood of Jesus has been sprinkled on you by faith so that when God looks at you, he doesn't see someone who is identified by their past sins. He sees Jesus. And God loves Jesus. And because he sees Jesus on you, he accepts you. He welcomes you. He calls you a part of his family. That you are loved by God. You are accepted by God. And guys, that is good news. Because on our own, by our own works, God would never accept us because we fail miserably. I was talking to a person this week that was discouraged by the struggles that he was facing and constantly struggling with sin. I had to remind him that God was bigger than his sin. For us to think that our sin is bigger than God and grace and love and forgiveness is to walk in pride and arrogance that somehow that we can out God's grace and out God's forgiveness and out God's mercy in our lives. And you can't. That's why Paul in Romans reminds us there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can separate us from the love of Jesus. That's good news. That's good news for you. It's good news for me. And it was good news for the, right, for the people in Hebrews. The writer is saying that we, he wants you to have full assurance that your hearts have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Because, listen, your conscience is going to tell you that you're unworthy. 
Your conscience is going to tell you that you're evil. Your conscience is going to tell you that you're not accepted, that God is going to give up on you, that God is going to say that you failed one too many times, that you messed up too much. And the writer is saying, no, remember, it's not about what you did and what you didn't do. It's about what Christ did that makes you acceptable to God. You are clean by faith. And maybe there's some of you in this room this morning that don't know that. You've never experienced a clean conscience. And you know that if you were to stand before a God, you would not be accepted by God because you know the life you've lived. And so the writer of Hebrews is encouraging you, encouraging you this morning and saying, stop trusting in yourself and start trusting in Jesus. Let your hearts be sprinkled clean so that you can have a clear conscience and your bodies are washed with pure water. He's referencing baptism there. If you've been baptized, you know that baptism doesn't make you clean, but it's a picture or an image of the pure water of Christ, the living water cleansing you and making you new. Look at verse 23. Let us then hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day, the day approaching. Hold fast. Grip. Hold on and don't let go. It is your only hope. You don't have anything else because God is faithful. And what he has said, you can trust. He says, if he says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. If he says you've been accepted, you are accepted. Don't trust any other word other than his because your conscience will tell you differently. But God says that Jesus is enough. You're accepted because of Jesus. You're forgiven if your faith is in him. In the beginning of the story, of the biblical story, all the way back in the fall, before the fall, Adam and Eve had intimate relationship with God. They hung out with him. There was this perfect union between humanity and God. Beautiful communion then they believe the lie that it is better to be God yourself and do life without him and prove yourselves by your own works instead of walking by faith, trusting what God says is true about you. And in the moment they say no to God and say yes to self, they destroy that harmony. They destroy that relationship. And at that point, God casts them out because they reject him. And from that moment on, it was God's intent to bring us back to that place where we are with him, untarnished, without sin, completely unified in perfect communion, God and humanity. His plan was to come and dwell among us in the person of Jesus. The picture of the temple was a, just a shadow of things to come. This is a sign that God wanted to dwell, dwell with us. Listen, God always wanted to be among us. The temple was temporary. In fact, God tells them, you think I was homeless, that I needed a place to sleep? You think I, you needed to build me a place? Who do you think I am? I'm God. I don't need you to build me anything. And you remember Jesus, when he shows up, he says, you're going to destroy this temple. I can destroy this temple, and it will be rebuilt in three days. And everyone freaks out, but later we find out that Jesus wasn't talking about the actual temple. He was talking about his own body. He's saying, I'm the temple. I am the presence of God. I am God who became man to dwell among you so that you can get to God. And in the middle of sinful humanity, a holy God shows up and dwells among us. God begins to walk around. The, reasons why the, re the reason why the religious leaders freaked out and didn't like Jesus because here's a guy that claims to be God, yet at the same time, he's hanging out with prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors and rebels. You're God and you're putting yourself among those kind of people? Why? Because he knew he was going to the cross and die and he would shed his blood to cover the sins of all of these people. And why did those people love to gather around Jesus? because they wanted to be around the one that reminds them that God is for them and not against them. It is good 
to gather around Jesus. What the writer in Hebrews is saying is, we now all have, ha- we now all have access to Jesus because of faith. We can now enter into the holy place. Every single one of us, any single moment can go to God and be with God, and there's nothing you have to do. It's already been done. Just enjoy the presence of God in your life. Here's what happens. It happens in Hebrews, and it happens with us. We start going, I don't need to be with anyone else. Just me and God. Personal relationship with me and God. Who needs the church? Who needs to gather together? The difference between us and the church in Hebrews or Rome was that the church in Rome would gather in houses and we gather in buildings called churches. And when the Bible was talking about a household, it wasn't talking about just a couple of people in a family gathering together. It's talking about a pretty good amount of people that would get together to worship Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, you guys aren't getting together anymore. It's not... You guys aren't hanging together as a church. You have a bunch of households in the city, but you're not getting together. You're rejecting being together as a family. And things are getting rough. There's suffering going on. There's persecution going on. Things are getting difficult. And you're beginning to drift and wander because you don't have people reminding you over and over and over again that you can hold on to with assurance that Jesus did it all for you. The writer is going to tell him it's not okay if you guys think that you can just be you and God and not be part of a larger body because we need one another. We need to be reminded that Jesus is enough. Why am I saying this? Because listen, we live in a culture that says I love Jesus, but I hate the church. And many of us have heard that statement. Let me be clear. You can't say that. The church is God's people. And if you love Jesus, it means you're God's people. So what you're saying is you hate yourself. It's an arrogant statement to say that. Because you're fundamentally saying, I've got Jesus figured out, but everyone else is jacked up. That's pride. That's arrogance. You are just as messed up as everyone else that's making a bad name for Jesus. We all are. So don't reject the church because the church is desperately in need of Jesus. Embrace her because you're part of it. One of the church fathers, and I can't remember who, I think it was Luther, said that the church is a prostitute and yet she is my mother. She's not faithful. She fails Jesus miserably. She doesn't do things right. But I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the church. Don't hate her. And let me be clear about one other thing. I think it's been wrongly miscommunicated, even in our community, that Sunday morning doesn't matter. That if we're engaged in mission and community groups and outreach and going places globally, then that's what matters. It doesn't matter if we show up on Sunday morning. Just personally speaking, why in the world would I spend hours working on messages, some that goes right over your heads, but some that you guys need to hear? Why would the worship team spend hours preparing, planning, if it didn't matter? Sunday mornings matter. And I want to encourage you, we need Sunday mornings together. We need it, and I want to encourage you, because if you want to be a part of this family, be devoted to the things that Scripture commands us to be involved in. In our context, we need to hear this. When you start thinking that you don't need the larger body, eventually you'll be in trouble. You'll begin to drift away. That's why verse 24 is so important. Let us consider how to stir one another toward love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet one another as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Let me be clear. As people that love Jesus... We expect to obey this command. Not because this is a to-do list, but because you need Jesus, and I need Jesus, and we need to be reminded about Jesus over and over and over again. What are they doing? 
What they are doing, he's saying is that you're going to stop holding fast to the basics of your faith if you aren't around each other, encouraging one another, challenging one another in this. Why do we need to gather? In order for us to see that, we need to go back a few pages all the way to Matthew 28. If you would, turn with me to Matthew 28. There's a, you guys are familiar with the story of Jesus right before he ascends to heaven. Matthew 28 is the short version of Hebrews 10. Jesus keeps it simple. Whoever wrote Hebrews just is like me, just kind of takes it on and on and on and on. And so he expounds on it. But in verse 16 of Matthew 28, the 11 disciples go to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus tells them to go. And when they see him, they worship him. But some doubted. Think about the context here. Jesus had just been crucified. Jesus tells them what they have done to me, they're going to do to you. It's not like they're enjoying their best life now. That's not what was going on at all. They were coming to the grips that the reality is they were going to suffer for their faith. So there's some real doubts going on in their hearts. There's questions. There's wondering. But what I love is that when they see Jesus, they fall on their feet, they fall on their face, and they worship Jesus. They begin in the right place. They get on their faces and they say, you are worthy of our lives and we're struggling like crazy right now. We're doubting, we're having a hard time. But what do they do? They fall on their faces and they begin to worship Jesus even in the midst of their doubt. Some of you are doubting and struggling and weak and you need help and you need to get together every week and get on your feet, and get to the feet of Jesus and declare he is Lord, he is worthy of worship and not forget how good he is because we're never going to make it this week if we don't get reminded that he is faithful and he is good. That's what's going on here. Jesus knows that if their lives don't revolve around him, they're done. We're the same way. It's very possible that some of us can build our lives around our jobs instead of Jesus. It's very possible that some of us can build our lives around our our family instead of Jesus. It's very possible that some of us can build our lives around community instead of Jesus. It's very possible that some of us can build our lives around mission and making disciples instead of Jesus. It's very possible that some of us can build our lives around this building or this church instead of Jesus. And let me be clear, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have a thing. You don't have any hope. And that's why Jesus is being, making very clear here. And in the next verse in Matthew 28, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus says, I know you're struggling. I know you're hurting. I know you're weak. I know life is hard. I know that life isn't easy. But don't forget, I'm in charge. I'm in control. I will build my church. I will build my people. I am the king of kings. I am the Lord of lords. I have all authority. You're not coming to someone who doesn't know what he's doing or doesn't have the power to change things in your life. I have it all. Don't forget me. And it's interesting that when Jesus tells them to go on mission, he tells them to go and wait for power. What do they do? They go and they wait and they pray and they gather together and when the Holy Spirit comes on them and they begin to preach with power, people's lives are changed. But what preceded it? Worship. Worship preceded it. Lives were changed because it began with the worship of Jesus. You're not going to see a difference in this community if it doesn't begin with the worship of Jesus. You're not going to see your friends saved if it doesn't begin with with the worship of Jesus. You're not going to see revival happen if it doesn't begin with the worship of Jesus. No missions program is going to change this city. No outreach that we plan up is going to change this city. It begins with declaring he is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. And we need to do this over and over because you're going to forget it this week, as will I. It'll probably just take you a few hours. You're going to drive home and you're going to forget. You're going to think that you are God and you're going to think that it's all based on you. 
You're going to think about school tomorrow or work tomorrow and exam this week, and you're going to get stressed out, and, and, and he's going to go, didn't you listen to what you, heard, what you heard? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's why you need to be coming back week in and week out because you need to be reminded along with the rest of the family that we need Jesus, that we call, we're called to worship Jesus. It is all about Jesus. It's not about you and your kingdom. It's about Jesus. And so that's the main reason we come together and we never forget what this is about. It's about Jesus. Secondly, Jesus continues and he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The second reason we're to come together is to, so that we can be reminded of who we are and remind each other of who we are. Your baptism is a sign, is a way of saying that you will never, a, a way of saying you will never forget that there was a moment in your life where you went under water identifying with the death of Jesus, but then coming up, identifying with the resurrection of Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. You realize it. You realize that something new has happened. You realize you're changed. And you were baptized into the Trinitarian identity who God is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What that means is that you need to be reminded and need to be reminded on a weekly basis so that you don't forget who you are. You're baptized in the name of the Father. Because God the Father looked at you and looked at me, people who were by nature rebellious and sinful, and we didn't want anything to do with God. We were not children of God. We were enemies of God. We were destined for destruction. We should have been rejected and removed from God's presence forever. But God, in his mercy, came in the form of his son, Jesus, and he lived a perfectly submitted life to God the Father on our behalf. And Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so that you and I can become the righteousness of God by faith in him. So what happens is that instead of God seeing you, he sees Jesus covering your life. Your life is hidden in Jesus. You have a whole new clothing. And when God the Father looks at you, he sees his beloved son. And God loves his son. Because Jesus is your life now. And God looks at you and he has the same favor and love that he has toward Jesus. And you need to be reminded on a weekly basis that God loves you. That he's not against you. He accepts you. He's not waiting for you to perform so that you can be loved. You are loved. Don't forget it. The world is going to tell you that you have to earn it. Jesus purchased it for you. Just enjoy it. Enjoy it. Rest in it. Revel in the love of God. Be amazed by the fact that God loves you. You need to hear that every week. I need to preach it, and I need to preach to me every week because I need to be reminded that God loves me. Let me be clear. We're never going to go out into a city and tell them that God loves them if we first don't know how much God loves us. That's why we need to be here, to be reminded God loves us. We don't deserve it, but he loves us. Secondly, we were baptized in the name of the Son. In Matthew's gospel, the Son is the King. He's the King of kings. This is what's amazing about Jesus. All of the other kings in the world, they show up, and they man the kingdom and they want people. So how do you get people? You go and capture some people. Well, but to capture some people, you need warriors. So I need to build an army. But then a king also needs some land. So I better get an army to capture people so I can get their land. Then I'm going to need a bunch of wise people around me. I need wealth. So once we capture these people, we're going to take their stuff and make it our stuff. I need servants. So when we capture these people, some of these people are going to become my slaves and my servants, and they're going to serve me forever. That's what kings do. What does Jesus do? He shows up and says, I don't need a kingdom. I have a kingdom. You need a kingdom? You need land? I'm not going to take your land. In fact, I'm going to give you my land. I'm going to go into my home and prepare a home for you. Do you need money? Listen, you can be co-heirs with me. Everything I have is yours. I will share my stuff with you. You don't have to do anything. You need to be rescued and set free? Don't worry. I will go. I will set you free. I don't need an army. I'll do it myself. Jesus doesn't say, I need you. 
He says, you need me, and I will give you me. He doesn't say, I need a bunch of servants. He says, no, I'm going to come, and I will serve you. I will give my life as a ransom for many. He will give you what you don't have and then set you free to be what you can't be. I will make you a people who gets a kingdom for nothing. It's amazing. You need to hear that every week. This is my king. This is what he has done for me. He has liberated me. He has set me free. He has given me access to God. And I need to be reminded of that week in and week out, that I'm only here because Jesus took my place. That's who we worship. And you need to be reminded of that week in and week out. Jesus says in another story, he says, there's going to come a day where I'm going to divide the sheep and the goat. And to those who are sheep, he's going to say, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. Blessed are you, enter into my Father's kingdom. And they're going to say, when did I do that to you? We never fed you. We never went and visited the prisons. And Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And then he's going to look at the goats and he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because when I was hungry, you didn't give me food. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. When I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. Depart from me. I never knew you. Let me be honest, that verse scares the life out of me. There are people who are going to say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus will say, I never knew you. There are going to be people who thought their whole life that they knew Jesus and didn't know them. They didn't know him because it was empty religion. Let me be clear, when Jesus says, I never knew you, it doesn't mean we have to do a lot of good things to enter into his kingdom and enjoy him forever. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you have to know me. And the evidence that you don't know me is because you didn't realize that you were the least of these. You were naked, and I clothed you with righteousness. You were hungry, and I gave you my bread of life. You were in the prison of Satan and his demons and sin and darkness, and I hung on the cross so that you can be set free. If you knew that I did that for you, you would live an entirely different life in front of others. But the evidence that you serve no one is the evidence that you didn't know me. You don't know what I did for you. Because if you knew it, it would change you. He isn't saying do good things and you'll be accepted. He's saying that the things you do shows that you are accepted. The things that you do show that you understand God's grace in your life, that you didn't deserve it, but because you got everything that you didn't deserve, you now get to live for him in everything. And everything I do, I want to do as if I'm doing it unto Jesus. And listen, you need to hear that every week. That your life and what you do outside of this context is for Jesus as well. You need to be reminded that you have a father that loves you unconditionally. You need to be reminded that you have a king that's unlike any other king. You need to hear that. And finally, you are baptized in the name of Jesus, in the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit leaves, the Holy Spirit, when Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers, and there is power that is given to the believers. Paul reminds us that if you are a child of God, you have the same spirit in you that raised Jesus from the dead. So you have the very power inside of you that took Jesus out of the grave. You have the very power of Jesus inside of you that Jesus used to preach and proclaim and do miracles. You have the same power inside of you that Jesus had to cast out demons. You have the same power inside of you that Jesus had to heal the sick and raise the dead. You have that. I don't know about you, but that's amazing to me that Almighty God would take residence in my life and the same power that God enabled Jesus to raise the dead lives inside of me. You're loved unconditionally. You have a king that will serve you and you have the same power of God that Jesus had. Listen, I need to be reminded of that on a weekly basis and so do you. And here's what happens if we drift. Here's what happens if we don't take coming to church seriously. 
you become depressed, you become discouraged. And you'll begin to think that it's all about you. And you'll forget that God is for you, not against you. You'll forget that God is there every step of the way. Listen, I'm preaching this with passion this morning because I know way too many people that have drifted and said, church is not important, career is more important. And the enemy is having a field day with their lives. If you think that you can do this without coming to church and being reminded regularly who your king is and that you are loved and that God is with you and that you have the power of God in your life, if you think you can do all of this without that, you're fooling yourself. And there is arrogance and pride in you and you need to repent and turn back to God and say, I can't do this alone. I need help. I need encouragement. I need a body to regularly spur me on to love and to good deeds. I will not give up on meeting together. Devote yourself to this gathering. Be committed to it. Don't be fooled. The enemy wants to take you out. You need us. I need you. We need each other. Gather together regularly. Don't forsake it. We want to know you. We want to love you. We want to care for you. We don't want you to drift. We care too much for your soul. Listen, I love you guys. And I am so glad I get to be a part of this. But beyond that, the Father loves you. The last thing he says before we go to the table this morning. Jesus says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. We need to get together and say, guys, come on. I know this is hard. I know the world is telling you to live differently. I know trying to live for Jesus is hard, but listen, it's worth it. Following Jesus is a worthy cause. Jesus gave his life for us. So let's obey him. Let's not keep falling into sin over and over. Let's push ourselves to do what Jesus is calling us to do. See, what I'm hoping is that as we gather together, when we encourage one another, as we spur one another, we spur one another toward living for Jesus with our lives, and we spur one another toward good deeds and love. As we do every week, we're going to go to the table because like I said, it is all about Jesus. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't know the love of the Father. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't have anything. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. We have everything we have because of Jesus. If you believe that, I want you to go to the table this morning and I want you to celebrate the body that was given for you. He has made a way where there is no more curtain or high priest that you have to go through. You don't need a pastor to get to him. You can go directly to Jesus. You get to go right to God. And we need to be reminded of him and all the blessings that we have because of him. This morning, as you reflect, would you remind yourself that you have a God who loves you? Not because you're perfect, but he loved you while you were still his enemy. He loved you when you had not wanted nothing to do with him. He sent his son while you were still sinners. Would you be reminded that you have a king who took your place and gave you his kingdom and now is working on your behalf? Would you be reminded that as you live this life, you have the power that raised Christ from the dead? And as you do, would you remind yourself that all of this is because of Jesus? The way we do communion here at Love City, we allow you to meditate and pray and reflect on the message and the worship team will sing. And whenever you are ready to come and grab the elements, the elements are ready on either side. Come and grab the elements and bring them back to your seat in a few moments. I'll come. 
back up and we'll pray and partake of it together. So, Father, this morning as we have meditated on this word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, would change us, that we would resolve in our hearts to be fully committed to gathering together so that we will be reminded that it's about Jesus. The only reason our lives have value and worth is because of your love. And so, Father, today we humbly say thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for convicting us. It is not because of us, it is because of you. And to you we give glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name.